community. For us, that means both Durham and Raleigh when we look at bandwidth cares. But we wanted to provide a mechanism and an outlet and a system for our employees to get involved in the community. And so you can look at bandwidthcares.org and get a feeling for what it's all about, but it, it, it comes up with three different types of programs. One is something called bandwidth missions. Twice a year, we push our employees out of the office to work together in intra-departmental teams, so people from different teams, sales, with ops, with legal, et cetera, getting out there and doing something like working on a habitat house or uh, overseeing a field day for the Methodist Home for Children or some sort of a team building and community service element. That's something that's on bandwidth.com sometime. The second thing that we have is something called the Bandwidth Volunteer. We want to provide material in the community for things that are their, are their own volition, their own choosing. So if an employee comes to us and says, listen, I've been volunteering with Big Brothers Big Sisters, or I've been doing this with my church, or I've been doing this with the YMCA, or the list can go on. It's, it's in, pretty much interminable, as long as it addresses the human condition. Um, well, one of our famous projects, and, and I've got to be careful because there's nothing wrong with this per se, but uh, a group of folks wanted to remove non-indigenous plant species in Olmstead Park, and that was one thing that didn't qualify. So I'm all about getting non-indigenous plant species out on so I think that's great for people really into that, but this, our particular plan is addressing the human condition. So as long as it does that, uh, for every uh, 32 hours you do in a program like that, we'll give you a paid day off up to a limit of three additional vacation days. We, again, we want to be able to take folks. And how many of you all have a workforce that's relatively young? Say the average age is 35 or younger. Okay. We do too. Um, and it's, for us, it's right around 32, 33. We feel that we have an obligation, or at the very least an opportunity, to help model community service. And we understand that, we, that uh, while this should be ingrained in us from childhood, it should be a no-brainer that many folks need to be able to be led to the opportunity and provide some level of inducement. For us, that's worked very, very well. Um, yes? How many employees do you have? I'm just curious. Yeah, about 190. 190. So have you been doing all this since it was small, or is this? No, this has always been in existence now for about two years. So we had done this very informally for a while, and we'd get together as a team and do different things. But we realized that there needed to be some sort of a structure behind it. And for us, it was, uh, David and I would like to think that we do a good job with leadership, but um, uh, we need to have a structure like this. And, and, and let me tell you about the successes and failures of this when we launched it. Uh, we launched this with great fanfare two years ago. We had all of our employees together, and it was a big hoopla, and we were really excited about rolling this out. We thought that it was reasonably innovative and something that would be very, very good for the company. And without uh, fail, without exception, the general mood of folks leaving was very, very good. So we're all about metrics at our company, about measuring how successful an initiative is and so businesses succeed. And so we measured the results after three months and found that fewer than 3% of our employees had done anything on Bandwidth Volunteer. And so uh, the thing that we, uh, and, and when really what we launched first was the Bandwidth Volunteer Program. And the third one, to get back to that again, there are three things. Come back to the story here in a second. Three things. One is bandwidth mission, bandwidth volunteer, and then bandwidth fundraise. Bandwidth fundraise is whenever 10 or more employees get together for a fundraising event, like a walkathon or something like that, we'll match the funds they raise up to $1,000. So those are three projects. When we launched the program, we only had two bandwidth volunteer and bandwidth, bandwidth fundraise. We talked about this great program. You get out there, you can earn paid time off, get out there and find volunteering things. <coughs> and we found that there's less than 3% compliance. So maybe 10 folks went out there and did something. You know, it was really frustrating. It's really uh, almost depressing because we thought, you know, we're like, is this our leadership? Is this a sign that the business is going down? What does this all mean? Um, but it was something that I think is somewhat akin to what a, a, a pastor or preacher feels on Sunday when they talk about us getting out there and obeying the commands of Christ and we're all fired up on Sunday and then Monday rolls around. And then the idea of getting involved in the community just starts to wane. You know, because we get in the office, we have 50 voicemail or email or something. And so that's where Bandwidth Commission came about. We went ahead and we did these uh, events where one, one of our employees would spearhead a project that other folks would get on, and then they did it in droves. 
everybody was really excited about doing it as a team. What they needed to do is they needed to be provided with a little bit more of a, it's kind of like you go to a restaurant and there are a thousand things on the menu, you just, I don't know what to do. Should I volunteer for Big Brother's Big Sister? Should I do this? Should I do that? I can do that. But when somebody says, hey, we're getting a bunch of people together to go to Big Brother's Big Sisters this week, man, now I'm in, right? And so that was the thing we learned about six months into our program, that folks like structure. So they were behind the idea of community service, they just needed to be shown a little bit more direction. Uh, and that really helped us succeed with this program. Any questions about this as we move on? By the way, is I've, I've been told by Kelsey this is a very informal structure. Ask questions as we go along. Uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end, too. Um, and then particularly towards the end, as you have ideas and things you've seen, I like to bring them up. And then somebody, can somebody watch the time for me? Maybe Spencer? Well, how are we good? What time is it right now? 10 to 9. 10 to 9? 5 to 9. 5 to 9, okay. We're going to have a hard stop right at 9.30. So I'll stay around a little bit afterwards, but everybody should feel free to leave any time. And if you want to leave at 9.15, that's fine too. Okay, so the next, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Durham Cares. Durham Cares is more specific to the community. It is not tied in in any way uh, officially to bandwidth by town. Uh, Durham Cares is an organization that was inspired by the parable of the Good Samaritan. How many people have heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan? So I'm not a pastor, I'm not going to go into it very much, but I can tell you about the inspiration and application for us as an organization. Uh, it's really twofold. One is the broader definition of neighbor. So as you all remember from the parable, the Samaritan was the hated enemy of the Jewish person. Samaritan now has a positive connotation when we hear about it. Back then it was a very bad thing. And so when the Samaritan reached out to help the Jewish person in the ditch, that was a surprise and a shock about who your de what the definition of neighbor is. Because the man goes to Jesus and says, tell me, what do I need to do? You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. He says, I've got that. What do I need to do next? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? And then he said, well, let me tell you who your neighbor is. And then described the parable of the Samaritan. And the Samaritan, the hated enemy of the Jewish person, was the neighbor in this case. And so our application is, our neighbor is not just a person who lives across the street from us or next door to us. Our neighbor is a person who lives across town. And yes, in our application, actually means a person who lives across the world. The Samaritan was of a different nation than the Judeans. And so we focus mostly on our backyard. And by our backyard, I mean people here in Durham. We also have applications worldwide, too. And the second application of the parable of the Good Samaritan was the physical love that the Samaritan showed the person in the ditch. He didn't just do, as I have often done in the past, give the guy some money and roll on. Or look for somebody else who could help him. Say, you take care of him. I'll give you some money to do that. That's the way that I had provided love in the past. That's not at all what happened here. And uh, Jesus does not use a lot of words, um, uh, great economy of words in the Bible, but he takes goes to great detail to show the physical love that the Samaritan showed the guy in the ditch. He got off his donkey. He went and he bandaged his wounds. He anointed him. He gave up his donkey for the rocky hilly road. Uh, he then went and took care of his, uh, all of his needs at the hotel and said, I'm going to come back and put money. Great deal to the physical love that he provided, not through an intermediary. There's a great book called The History of American Compassion done by a guy named Marvin Olasky. Anybody heard of the book? So Marvin Olasky is an historian, and he chronicles service and charity in America from the 1600s all the way through the present day. There was a time in our history when we nailed social services. It was in the 1600s and 1700s, where when somebody was destitute and needed help, we invited them into our houses, and we took care of them. We got them back on their feet, and then they were set. There weren't any abuses of the social welfare system back then, because if somebody was freeloading on you, you kick them out. There's no opportunity for there to be abuse, willingly, willing abuse. I mean, we all know about Mount Dillon's, but for somebody who goes ahead and just willingly takes advantage of the system, it didn't exist. It didn't exist until we decided that we could institutionalize and provide intermediaries for care. This is not to say that every one of us should take three homeless people in our house tomorrow and put, put people like Lloyd out of a job. That's not what I'm saying. I think that there absolutely is a place for intermediaries. I think that it works well with the system. But it's the mindset. 
the mindset of actually getting out there and physically loving on somebody who we might not otherwise do. And so 